Thank you so much, Julie. Um, there are people dropping out of my program left and right as you know, life starts to spin towards how it used to be pre-pandemic. And I'm like, I won't quit. <laughs> I also won't sleep. Um, <laughs> um, that's not true. I have to sleep. My body, you know, cuts out on me. Um, anyways, hello, everyone. It is so lovely to see you. Hello. Um, I see someone here is from Ashland, Oregon, which is great because I'm in Ashland, Massachusetts. We're on like the edges of the the Route 90, really, uh, from C to C. So this is such a wonderful space to be in. Look at us learning Torah all across the country. Um, so yes, this week is Parsha Korach, and I am very much looking forward to exploring this with you. Um, and, you know, I, I just want to say I... I focused on this one particular piece of Korach that was really speaking to me um, because actually Parsha Korach was my smicha Parsha. That was the Parsha the week I got rabbinic ordination. And so my teacher, Art Green, said, you know, at the ceremony, you know, we've gone, we, we always tend to be on the side of um, Korach and um, because we are the people, but you know, as rabbis, we also have to be on the side of Moshe and understanding that. Um, and I think the best leaders are able to be on both sides and understand both perspectives. And that's really what we have to do. And we have to lead from wherever we are, which um, was a little bit of what I said at the Minyan on Tuesday, if you come to the My Jewish Learning uh, Daily Minyan. Um, so I'm glad to revisit this parasha. Um, and think about uh, Rabbi Art's words to us and the world around us. So let's start with a blessing on our Torah study. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam, Asher Kiddushanu B'Mitzvota V'Tzivanu La'asok B'Divrei Torah. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, Master of the Cosmos, who makes us holy, sets us apart through these mitzvot and gives to us the special mitzvah of occupying ourselves with Torah study. And may it be your will, God, that these words of Torah that we learn today are so inviting and sweet and that they open themselves up to our understandings and our interpretations and that we're able to mine their depths for relevance in our day in order for it to be Torah Chaim, in order for it to be living Torah and Torah for our lives. And may the Torah that we learn, the values that we take away from this text study root itself within us so that we become vessels for this Torah and we can share this Torah with all who look to us for teaching, be it our neighbors, our children, our parents, our friends, whoever comes to us. May we shine with the light of this Torah and may we continue to have lives that allow us to just pause in the middle of the day and study Torah Lishma like this, study Torah for its own sake. Uh, may we continue to merit such a privilege in this life. Baruch Ata Adonai HaMelamed Torah Le'amo Yisrael. Blessed are you God who teaches Torah to us the people of Yisrael who struggle with meaning for God. So, oh, here comes Shula Reinhardt. That's a TBZ member. How great. Uh, I love seeing familiar people that I know and familiar faces. All right. So let me share my screen because we're going to just jump in to Korach. Let me just make it a little bigger. All right. Even bigger. That's too big. <laughs> okay. So... Um, so we're going to just start at the beginning of this week's Torah portion, uh, with, which is Korach. Um, it says now, and we'll come back to this in bold and now, now Korach, son of Yitzchak, son of Kohat, son of Levi, took upon himself, among, along with Datan and Aviram, sons of Eliav and On, son of Pelet, descendants of Reuven, to rise up against Moses together with 250 Israelites, chieftains of the community, right? These are people chosen in the assembly, men of repute. Um, a word about these people. 
Um, so we've got Korach who's leading this charge um, and his, <laughs> we'd say cronies, but like his, his uh, friends, cousins, um, who are together with the 250 other Israelites, but these aren't just like Joe Schmo Israelites. These are leaders in the community chosen in the assembly. Today, we might say like people we voted for, um, men of repute, people who have a name in Hebrew, it says, um, Anshe Shem, right? So these are respectable people that Korach is coming, has, has, is bringing along to Moses and Aaron and saying to them, you have gone too far for all the community are holy, all of them, and Adonai dwells within them. Why then do you raise yourselves above Adonai's congregation? And when Moses heard this, he fell on his face. So I want to point out just in the Hebrew really quickly. It says, um, they gathered via Kalu al Moshe, which, you know, we talk about uh, Kehillah, which is community, right? They bonded together against Moses and they said, Rav Lachem. And we'll come into what that means. Thank you, Rashi. Um, because everyone here is holy. I'm going to make this a little smaller so we can hold both in, at the same time. Everyone here is holy. Um, Adonai. It says God is dwelling within them. And that is like a hyperlink in our minds. We're hearkening back to what we often, you, uh, what we sing at TBZ. I'm not sure if you sing. Um, it's uh, the verse from Parshat Truma, Ve'asuli mikdash ve'shachanti betocham. Right, if you build me a mikdash, I will, a sacred place, a sanctuary, I will dwell betocham amongst the people. Or from a more spiritual perspective, I will dwell within the people. If you make me this a sanctuary, sacred space within each of them, I will then come and dwell within each of them. So Korach is saying, you said make a sanctuary, and we did. Right? So, so God is then dwelling in each and every Israelite, as you have said. So then why do you, Moses and Aaron, raise yourselves above Kahal Adonai? Right? This group of people that all have equal access, apparently, according to what you said, to Adonai. Now, when Moses heard this, he fell on his face. And I just have so much Rachmanus, so much compassion for Moshe Rabbeinu in this moment, because I always think back, like, this is exactly what he was saying at the burning bush. He was like, God, you got to send somebody else. What am I going to do when they don't listen to me? And here we are. His fears realized they don't want to listen to him anymore. So he fell on his face. All right. So let's go into what is all of this? What do these words mean? Because... I, when I looked at this, I was like, well, what, what do you mean now? Like, what's going on that's now? Why didn't he do it later? What prompted him, uh, Korach, to jump into this? Um, and every time I hear this, I, I think, and I'm assuming that's why <laughs> Rabbi Green was like, you have to say something on behalf of Moses, because every time I hear this, I'm like, well, you know, this isn't a bad argument. So we're going to go into some things that we can take away from this parsha. So we start with Rashi who is um, 11th century uh, medieval commentator writing out of France. Um, and Rashi is like the go-to word on how we understand Torah, the first stop on our list of commentators and how we understand. So Rashi writes uh, in response to the, the beginning of the parasha, Vayikach Korach, and Korach took. Well, he betook, he took upon himself on one side, right? He moved himself physically with the, with the intention of separating himself out of the community so that he might raise a protest regarding the priesthood to which Moses had appointed to his brother. Okay, that's what Onkelos. Now, Onkelos is a, a translation of the Tanakh into Aramaic, which was Aramaic, which was the language of the day. Um, and because not everyone understood Hebrew. So, you know, it's basically like if we, when we have JPS in English, and that's like the go-to thing that we go to. Um, Uncleus was the thing that people went to in Aramaic. It was the translation. And we learn a lot about the, the meaning of words by looking at how Uncleus translated. Same thing with how we look at other translations. We understand the intention beneath the words by looking at how they're translated in different editions. So Uncleus translated um, Vayikach as Ve'it Paleg, he separated himself. In Hebrew, also, 
um, peleg, plag, means to, to make a physical distinction between. So we're understanding that this, that Korach is separating himself out of the community. It's like he's picking up his stuff and his stuff and going over here and this is the rebellion side of the camp. Um, so he did this to separate himself from the rest of the community in order to maintain the dissension, right? It's a visual reminder. These people don't agree. Okay. Um, then Rashi gives us another option. Um, similarly, we have this piece from Job. Uh, why doth thy heart take thee aside? Uh, oh, I forgot to open that up. Should we open that up now? Mm, not yet. We'll come back to that. We're going to look at this Job piece in a little bit more detail because it helps us to understand. Um, meaning, why does your heart take you physically from other people, right? Like, why does your heart make you separate yourself so that your heart is in control? And another explanation is that Korach, what did he take? Korach took, won over, attracted the chiefs of the Sanhedrin among the people um, with fine words. So meaning he, he, they, they understood what he was saying. His cause was just. Um, the word here, it seems to be used as a, in a figurative sense. So Rashi is great and he's giving us three options for how we can understand what, what is this Vayikach Korach? What is Korach taking? One, he's taking himself separately out of the community, moving himself away. Two, his, um, his heart is taking him away, meaning like his his inner intentions are moving him separate from the people. And third, um, he took the people. The people were taken with his argument. Okay, so when I read this, as I, I think I may have given a, a little allusion to this, it is so easy to criticize our leaders. I am also counting myself as one of these people who criticizes leaders. Yet, who wants to step up into leadership? It's very easy for me in my couch to say, well, this is what they should be doing. Even I see my husband and my father-in-law doing this, you know, on like with sports, they should be doing this, they should be doing that. Well, if that's what you think, you should probably go out on the field and, <laughs> and do that, right? Nobody wants to do that. Um, and not everyone's capable of doing that. And I look around even today and think about how many boards are having trouble getting presidents or even trustees, even members, or how many volunteer organizations are desperate for help. Yet the same people will sit and say, well, this is what they should be doing and this is what they should be doing, right? It's easy to, to stand up against leadership. And in this case, it sounds like Korach's argument is like a random attack. Like what, we're starting off the Parsha, what's going on? But I think context from last week's Parsha might be helpful for us. Um, and, you know, it's, it's interesting to note and to remember that the lines of the Parshiot were drawn to help us have some sort of order for how we can digest the Torah every week. Um, but the story, the narrative transcends those lines. So it's not like everything that we need to know to understand Parshat Korach is right here. We have to move around in the Torah as we do. So we're just going to take a few steps back to the end of last week's Torah portion, which is here. Um, then we get this story. Once, when the Israelites were in the wilderness, they came upon a man gathering wood on Shabbat. Those who found him as he was gathering wood brought him before Moshe Aharon and the community leadership because gathering wood on Shabbat is an Avera. It is forbidden. It is something that is not done and punishable. So they saw this guy doing this thing in the community that was punishable. He was setting a bad example for other people who were looking towards him. He was defaming Shabbat, uh, defaming God. What do we do? He was placed in custody for it had not been specified exactly what should be done with him. Okay. Then Adonai said to Moses, the party in question shall be put to death. The community leadership shall pelt him with stones outside of the camp. So the community leadership took him outside the camp and stoned him to death as Adonai had commanded Moses. 
So some of us might want to rethink our Shabbat plans at this point. Um, as we know that the, uh, the punishment for, defame, for um, violating the Sabbath rules is death. Um, and I think, I wonder, like, maybe this is what happened. And Korach saw this and said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why do you get to decide that this person gets to die? Right? Like, we're, we're all equally holy. How come you get to make this decision? Maybe that's something that struck Korach. And in this moment, it says, now, now Korach stood up and started speaking and started his rebellion. Then it continues. It also says, um, ba -da -da -da. Adonai said to Moses as follows, speak to the Israelite people and instruct them to make for themselves fringes. We know this. This is the third paragraph of the Shema. Fringes on the corners of their garments throughout all the ages. Let them attach a cord of blue to the fringe at each corner. That shall be your fringe. Look at it and recall all of the commandments of Adonai and observe them so that you don't follow your heart and your eyes in a lustful urge, etc., etc. And so maybe Korach saw this and said, you know, maybe we should put a thread of red or maybe we should only put on three. And, and maybe Korach, there was something in here that just made Korach say, I can't do this anymore. I think we need better representation. Maybe it was just, we'll come back to that. So Rashi helps us continue to understand what is being, what's being said here? What's Korach's issue? So Rav Lechem, I'm going to scroll back up to, whoops, let me just move this out of the way. Whoopsies. Um, let me go back to the first part. Da, 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 more Rashi. I'll make this just a little smaller so I can see. Okay. Um, he says, Rav Lechem, you have gone too far for all the community are holy, all of them. All right, so Rashi helps us understand what that means. Let's scroll back down. Rav Lechem, you take too much upon you. In other words, you've taken much more than is proper for yourselves in the way of high office. Uh, today we would call this overreach. And I'm so glad that um, I was listening to a, an interview with someone yesterday on the Supreme Court because like none of this was in my mental space. I had no idea what this meant and I had no idea what they meant. <laughs> but when I was able to put the two together, I was like, oh, that's what that's what's happening. And so Korach is saying, no, no, no. This is a case of overreach. You don't have this kind of authority. You have taken on much more than is proper for you by way of the high office, right? Your office goes, has this much authority and only it goes to a certain point. Then he continues. Why then lift ye up yourselves above the assembly of the, the Lord? Why are you making yourselves greater than everybody else, right? Re remembering what he said, everybody has access to yod heh vav -Hey, right? V'shachanti mikdash, eh, excuse me, v'asuli mikdash, v'shachanti betocham. So God is now dwelling amongst the people, both in the co community collective and within each of them, right? So, whoopsies, let me move my windows. Ah, oh, sorry. Um, let me move myself away. There's so many things on my screen. Okay. Um, so it says, if you have taken royal rank for yourself, like, so Moses, if you were going to be the leader, great, you should at least have not have chosen, you, you should at least not have chosen the priesthood for your brother, right? That's his nepotism, <laughs> right? You should spread it out, right? You're keeping this leadership, um, too contained in one family, we're all equally holy. So it sounds like he's calling for more democratic leadership, which, you know, doesn't sound like a bad thing. We'll get to what the issues are. Um, it's not you alone who heard at Sinai. I am the Lord thy God. All the congregation heard it, right? Everyone was equally present. So we need more democratic leadership. And this sounds like a good thing to me. So as much as my teacher, as much as Rabbi Art Green was like, you know, you have to have a, uh, something to say on the side of Moses. I read this and I think, well, you know, Korach's cause is just, it, you know, what's, what's the issue? Well, let's keep going. Oh, is this, this is Ramban. Um, 
I, so I, I left the link here in the chat. Um, so if you want to go deeper into the Hebrew, by all means do. I'm going to just stay with the English because we only have a short time to learn today and, you know, we'll run back as we need to, to the Hebrew. So Ramban, who um, is one of our commentators writing a little bit later than Rashi, um, a couple like centuries later, two centuries later, um, looking back at Rashi, it's, yeah, looking back at Rashi, um, gives us, helps us both understand and gives us a slightly new interpretation of what's going on. So Vayikach um, Korach, this section is explained in a beautiful way in the Midrash of Rabbi Tan Chuma, which we'll get into at the end. Um, and so right now he's here, he's just going to summarize a little bit of what we've already talked about. Vayikach Korach, he physically moved himself to one side so that he could um, demonstrate his uh, dissension against Moses giving Aharon the priesthood. Um, and the Korach is claiming that it really belongs to all Yisrael. Um, and then we're looking at how Uncleus translated the word and what we learned that it, it comes to symbolize a physical separation. But then we're bringing, we're coming back to this piece of Job. Um, and I think I closed this. Oh, that's a bummer. Um, I closed this. I'm going to try to, let me open this really quickly. Hold on one second. Let me just move this out of my way because it's important. We're going to go into Job really quickly. Oops. Where's Job? I have to move this window. Job's under the window. Job chapter, I think it was 15, verse 12. Yes. So let me move this again. Um, so we know the story of Job, right? Like Job's a good guy. And then all of a sudden, all this terrible stuff starts happening to him. And um, rightly so, he gets wickedly depressed. And um, you know, everything is terrible. He's resenting God. He's resenting people. He's resenting humanity. Oy, oy, oy. And so his friend, Eliphaz, says to him, like, basically, what, like, Job, let's, let's for a moment step into reality. Like we all have life. We all have problems. Yours are extreme. Yes. But the, the, the manner with which you're challenging God and humanity, it's not fitting. He says right here, were you the first human being that was born? Like, do you think you're the first person to have such a problem? Or were you brought forth before the hills? Like, do you have this abundant wisdom and perspective on life that you can sit here and pontificate in this way? And so the verse that Ramban is lifting up for us, uh, like, why is your heart carrying you away like this? We'll see this is the same root, uh, taking you away. And so Ramban is illustrating that the use of this word here is um, a separation, but a separation that also lifts one up. Right, so here he's saying, why is your heart taking you to be greater than every other human being? Why are you lifting yourself up above everyone else? And so when we go back to Korach, which I'm gonna go here, Ramban is you know, explaining to us why Yikachacha, thy heart, which is what we just saw, this context of Job means, why does your heart carry you away to separate yourself from the rest of the people? And now we understand with a little bit of that context, why are you, like everyone else might, is like, okay with listening to Moses. Everyone else was there at the Theophany at Sinai. Nobody else is standing up like, you know, we need a new leadership. Why Korach? Are you feeling like you need to lift yourself up above everyone else? Why can't you just fall in line and do what we all need to do to get to where we need to go? That's the, that's the idea behind the question. But the opinion of the Midrash, Tanhuma, which we'll get to, um, what time is it? Well, we will get to it because it's really good. Um, 
is not exactly in accordance with what Rashi is saying. Um, because as we've said, like this means this division, Rashi's talking about a physical separation, right? Like picking up and moving himself away. Um, so the verse is not coming to say that Korach took himself physically to one side of the camp, which is what we've been um, thinking so far. What does it mean, Ramban? Um, rather, the meaning of this Midrash, Vayikach Korach, is that he took counsel in his heart. There's so many um, parenthetical comments here. It's really confusing to read in the English. He basically just had these thoughts to himself. And so in simple English, we would call this a resentment, right? He started to resent Moses and he was taking into himself. And I don't know if any of you have ever had a resentment, but I've had resentments before. <laughs> they, they, um, they can, they fester, right? They, they take us, they take us, right? Literally, they will take us to a different place. They will take us to um, separating thoughts. I just had a resentment this morning before I started uh, finishing this. I, I, somebody said something to me and I was hearing it in my own way, right? I was taking it the wrong way, right? And I was feeling, and then I got a second text message, which clearly explained this was not at all how the person intended it. This was my own way of taking it. Um, and I was like, yep, that's exactly what's going on with Korach. <laughs> we see, this is Torah Chaim. This is here for our lives. Um, so back to the text, back to Job, right? When Eliphaz is saying to Job, who's like, oi, 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 I'm resenting this. I'm in this place of, I call it like selfishness, self-seeking, like he's just, um, he can't get outside of his own experience. And Eliphaz is like, are you the only person on earth? Why does your heart lead you to lead you so that you should be thinking in secret, there's no justice and there's no judge and you don't reveal it, right? You're, you're, you're acting in this way instead of putting forth this just challenge. And then the verse in Job continues. I don't know if we noticed it. And why do your eyes wink? And Ramban says, for one can notice from the winkings, right? Like I, I am very expressive with my face. I have to be very cautious of this. Um, he's saying we can see on your face that you, even if you're not saying it out loud, right? Even if you're just thinking these negative thoughts, you're face is telling the story that you don't believe in the justice of God's world. You don't believe that there's justice. There's no judge. You think everything is unfair. You think you're being persecuted in your own, like in your own world and you can't get out of your own experience. Um, so Eliphaz said to Job, um, before Job was able to, like the rest of the book, then Job's like, let me clarify what I mean. Um, that basically what we just said, that like, there's no justice in the world. And so then Eliphaz says, um, what does God know? And can he judge through a dark cloud? Now, this is the true meaning of the reply of uh, Eliphaz to Job. Why you kachacha thy heart? Why are you taking your heart away? Why do your eyes wink? And it's apparent to one who considers this carefully. It was not apparent to me at first. Let me explain <laughs> how, I, how we understand this. In this instance, Job is removing himself from God's world. Job is separating himself, right? There's no justice in the world. Everything's unfair to me. I can't think about anyone else. It's all my experience, etc. And so what does God know? How can he judge through a dark cloud? Eliphaz is saying, but you can't fault God in this case because you're taking yourself, you're moving away from God. It's like, you know, like my daughter, she'll often say like, here, I wrote, I wrote a word over here. You have to guess what word it is. You know, any word in the English language it could be. It's like, so how, how can you blame God, Eliphaz is saying, for not 
being able to support you, lift you, help you, when you are pulling yourself away, you've got this dark cloud, how you're not making the space for God to penetrate and to come through. Um, why are you taking yourself out of this matter? Why are you exempting yourself from the kahal? Why are you making yourself greater in this respect than everyone else? We're all in this together. So back now to Korach, all of that's parenthetical to help us understand just the first two words <laughs> of the Parsha. What does it mean that Korach took? How did he take? So this explanation so far, Ramban is saying he's taking himself away. Through his own selfishness, he's removing himself from the Kahal. Uh, similarly, we find um, the term taking used to mean thinking. Um, um, or taking instruction. So Ramban is clarifying that, you know, he's not making this up. We have in our tradition the use of the word vayikach to mean thinking. So we see that Karach is just pondering, pondering, pondering. Um, why am I not in charge? Why is Moses in charge? We're all holy. And letting that resentment fester instead of being productive with it. We'll get to the process and the productivity in a moment. Um, so yes, just to, the rabbi said, you know, it doesn't say Korach quarreled, right? He wasn't fighting with anybody. It doesn't say he spoke, right? That would be a respectable thing to do. Um, or certainly he didn't command, um, Vayikach. He didn't take anything. Rather, it was that his heart took control of him. And, you know, we know at this time, the, our ancients, equated the heart and the mind. And so his mind, his passion, he was in his head about it. And Ramban confirms that the Midrash uh, confirms what he said, which here we go. Um, so Korach's challenge, we'll see, is the definition of arguments that are lo l'shem shemaim. And in our tradition, we have these two classes of arguments, and Korach is like the textbook case of arguments lo l'shem shemaim. And so l'shem shemaim, for the sake of heaven, means, you know, uh, the, 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 the prime example of what does it mean to have an argument for the sake of heaven are, are Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai. Both great schools of thought, both great rabbis and teachers, but they think about things differently and they have different opinions and they're never attacking each other as people. They just want to know how do we serve better? How do we do this mitzvah better? Right? So Beit Hillel says, you know, on the, for, for example, on Hanukkah, we light one candle the first night and then we ascend and light every night. So on the eighth night, all of the candles are lit and it's wonderful. And that's great. That's one way. And Beit Shammai says, you know, on the first night of Hanukkah, we light all candles and then every night we light we decrease one and then on the last night um there's only one candle left and that's gorgeous and they both have beautiful reasonings and both schools are just trying to figure out how do we do this mitzvah in the best way possible how do we bring more well i was gonna say more light but you know that's how do we do this the best way how do we honor god um and that's it Arguments lo l'shem shemaim aren't about honoring God. They're about exactly what Ramban is setting up for us, that, that selfish thought, right? And like, how do I, it's self-seeking, right? And, and it might be underlying, it might be that the cause and the words are good, right? Like we remember it said, vayikach korach, and korach was able to take the elders with his fine words. But it's all about the kavanah, right? It's about the intention. And it, You'll see, or we'll see, we won't get to this part today, but like after this, Korach doesn't say anything else in the Parsha, right? He just comes, drops this, boom, and then there's no more talking, right? There's no conversation. So that's part of helping us understand this is no L'shem Shemaim. This is not an argument for the sake of heaven. This is an argument for the sake of Korach. And so here are some examples of how we come to understand that this uh, is Lola L'shem Shemaim. It says um, in Midrash Tanchuma, which Rambana just said, you know, we should go look there. So now we're going to go look there. Uh, in Korach Tuk, what's written above? 
we looked back and said, you know, put tzitzit on, right? That was the end of last week's Torah portion. So then Korach quickly said to Moshe, right? Quickly. It's not like he sat and thought about it and was like, oh, you know, this makes sense. Blah, 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 blah. No, he was ready with the challenge and said, well, in the case of a talit, which is already techelet colored, right? Because it says put a fringe of techelet. Well, what about a talit that's fully techelet? What are we going to do with that? And so Moses said, um, you still have to put tzitzit on it, right? God said, put tzitzit on all your garments, even if it's techelet colored, put tzitzit on it, right? All your garments. And so Korach said, but wait, wouldn't, if it's already tzitzit, and if it's already techelet, the color of uh, blue, and the whole thing is made up of that color, if the whole garment being that color isn't enough to satisfy the mitzvah, then you think that the fringes are going to be enough to satisfy the mitzvah? What's going on here, Moses? Right? So it's like, okay, like, where is this coming from? So that's one example. Um, another example, a house, which is full of Torahs, let's say, Torah and Mishnah and all like a, like a Beit Midrash, let's say. It's, there's got, it's, it's a place that we know is full of holy books. So Korach says, well, does that place need a mezuzah, right? Like, because if we get the pieces that are in the mezuzah from these holy books and the whole house is filled with the holy books, then it should stand that we don't need to put a mezuzah on the door because it's already got the holy books in it. Moses says, it's not what it says, right? Like, <laughs> God says, put it on all your doorposts, put it on all our doorposts. And um, Korach's like, well, wait a second. If, like, a whole house full of books isn't enough, then how are these, like, two little... How are these two little partiot, these two little pieces that are in the mezuzah scroll, how's that going to be enough? This doesn't make any sense, Moshe. So then Korach, because Moshe did not answer his questions satisfactorily for Korach, right? Like Moses is saying, we look at the text. This is what the text says. Zehu, right? Like the end. The text is clear. And Korach's got his, you know, thinking going on in his head. And so he says, these are things about which you have not been commanded. Rather, you're inventing them by taking them out of your own heart. So that's what it means by, and Korach took, right? Because Korach was really taking these things out of his own heart, right? He, Moses was just looking at the text and being clear. And Korach was getting really deep in his ego. So these midrashim make clear the selfish and self-seeking nature of Korach's challenges. Korach's cause was just, right? Like, and I... I, I think it's absolutely fine to say like, well, you know, we've been, <laughs> we've been doing this for a little bit. Maybe before we go into the land, we should have an election, you know, <laughs> like maybe we should have some say in who's, who's leading us. Maybe, you know, I think it's a fine question to ask, but the issue that the rabbis consistently point out is that his process was not Lashem Shemayim, right? It doesn't say that he went to Moses and Aharon after the meeting where he knocked at the Ohel Moed and said like, hey, can I ask you a question? He did this in front of everybody, right? This was a blatant challenge. This, this was, um, this is not how things are done. Um, and I love that Mordecai Kaplan taught that God is, is the process, right? Like in that, that peace between peoples, that discussion, that's what makes something L'Shem Shemayim. And I, I want to say, um, I'm also hesitant to say that because I recognize that like not every situation lends itself to um, a gradualist process, right? Where we can hear one person's side and another person's side and we can, sometimes there are things that are urgent, right? When someone's life is on the line, uh, when there's been long injustice, right? But I don't think that that's the case here with Korach. And that's certainly not the case that the rabbis have painted for us throughout our history. But I wasn't there. So <laughs> I can't say. But you know, based on our tradition, this is not one of those instances. This is a time for um, if Korach and his folks really had a real challenge to find the way, the godly way between to create the um, to, to use the channels available to them to really bring about the change that they saw. It. So that's, that's what I have to say about Korach. But then what do we say about Moshe Rabbeinu? Well, no one gets out of here um, 
free of blame because part of being a leader is understanding the challenges and being connected to the people. And Moses knew that this was an issue. He knew this from the burning bush. They're not going to trust me. They're not going to believe me. Oh, yo, yo, what am I going to do? So for that, we lean on transparency and bringing others into the process and communication. And I've always had, you know, issues with reading. When I read the Torah, it's like, it gets from God, says this, here's that, da, 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 as a mouthpiece, which is fine, right? Like that's what it's supposed to be. But in thinking about how we learn these lessons for today and leadership today, right? Like that's not, that's not, uh, we have different expectations for our leaders today. And so if this were today for Moses to bring a little bit more transparency to the process and to acknowledge, you know, where we are, I didn't ask to be in charge, but here I are, here we, here I am, et cetera. Um, and I know he does that in places. And so I'm wondering if it was just a little too late for Korach and maybe that's the lesson that he learned from Korach. Um, so our goal, especially in these times is when we find ourselves in, in fierce disagreement and arguments are to remember, our goal is to remember the divinity of the process, right? That, that we're all in this together, no matter what it is, we're all here on this planet together. We're all seeking peace. I hope, I mean, like that's Dan Lachaf Sechut, right? We get, give the benefit of the doubt. We uh, trust that we're all seeking peace. Um, and that we're, intending to act for the sake of bringing that peace and holiness into the world and between people. So with that, I'm going to pause and um, turn it back to Julie.